Hello again. Uh, it's now the, ta the time for the last session um, of uh, this event. Um, as uh, has been traditional during the last uh, years of uh, this uh, event, the focus uh, is going to be the climate uh, change international negotiation. Uh, Lara Lazaro Touza is the moderator. Um, so I would like to invite uh, her and also Ana Rivero Fernandez, operating uh, partner uh, ESG in uh, Alantra Private Equity to, to come to the stage. Uh, our second speaker today in this session is uh, Manuel Geran, fellow at the European Climate Foundation. is connecting uh, to the session uh, from, from Brazil. I must apologize because uh, we are a little bit late and Emmanuel has been waiting. And I hope he is uh, at the screen now. Hello, Emmanuel. Thank you. Welcome to the, to the event. Um, from my side, I would like to introduce you very briefly, Lara. Uh, I know, I'm sure you know uh, her very well, so I, I will be very short. Lara, Lazaro is senior analyst at Del Cano Royal Institute and teacher in economic theory at Cardinal Tisner University College in Madrid. She holds a PhD from the London School of uh, Economic and Political Science, a master in environmental si assessment and evaluation from the, the same LSE, um, and a bachelor degree in economics from the University uh, Universidad Autónoma. Uh, when you are ready, please, Lara, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. It's uh, my distinct pleasure and honor uh, to be able to moderate this conversation on uh, COP28 and the road ahead. And for that, I have um, two distinguished panelists, um, Emmanuel Guerin, who's um, connecting online from Brazil. So thank you very much for coming online at this very early hour for you. Uh, Emmanuel, he's special advisor to Professor Laurence Dubiana at the European Climate Foundation. He's also a lecturer at uh, Science Po University in Paris. Uh, before that, he was the executive director in charge of international affairs at the European Climate Foundation. Um, he also is um, one of the architects of the Paris Agreement as in his role as a special advisor to uh, Laurent Subiana and to Laurent Fabius uh, from 2013 to 2015. He's associate director with Jeffrey Sachs of Sustainable Development Solution Network and senior staff soci associate at the Earth Institute in Columbia University um, and director for the Climate and Energy Program at IDRI from 2006 to 2012. Uh, and uh, Ana Rivero Fernandez, she is the operating partner ESG at Alantra Private Equity. Uh, prior to that, um, Ana has 30, more than 30 years experience in Banco Santander, holding different positions as global head of ESG at Santander Asset Management. And she is currently a member of the investment committee at the Calusco Banking Foundation and is professor of ESG at different universities and business schools here in Spain. So um, the topic of um, the, the main agenda items at COP28 include various topics. Um, Concluding the global stock take, we know that we have a 20 odd gigaton gap to fill and um, that has been made apparent not only in the latest IPCC report but also in the global stock take report. We need to conclude that at COP28 and we need to um, chart a path to pluck that gap. Uh, we know that uh, the mitigation and the European Union has welcomed the, the mitigation work program uh, focused on just transition. Uh, we are also going to strive for um, global adaptation goal and we have the pending issue of climate finance. We are hoping to close the, to bridge the gap uh, for the 100 billion in international climate finance that we pledged back in COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009 um, that was supposed to be um, reached annually by 2020. Um, in COP26 in Glasgow, we set a path to close that gap and we're hoping that will happen this year. However, we know we have to set a new goal, a new collective 
quantified goal um, next year, so we need to advance our negotiations um, for that. And uh, we also need to align our financial flows with a low carbon transition and a resilient development model. Um, in order to speak about all of these issues, I will start with Emmanuel. And Emmanuel, please, I would like to ask you uh, what, we know that the tasks ahead, what can we expect from COP28 given the current fragmentation and the very complex geopolitical situation? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, and I hope uh, you can hear me well um, in the audience. Um, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, really sorry, um, I can't be uh, with you in person, uh, but it's been really um, um, interesting to listen to the previous um, uh, panel. Um, in response to your question, uh, what can we expect um, at COP28 um, um, and to um, uh, prioritize um, a bit um, uh, the different um, issues um, you've alluded to? Um, let me uh, focus to start with um, um, on the um, issues that relate to the um, um, energy transition um, and um, um, uh, the role of uh, uh, fossil fuels um, um, and phasing out um, um, of them um, um, into uh, this transition, because obviously, um, given uh, where uh, the COP um, is um, happening in uh, Dubai, uh, this is um, inevitably um, uh, the um, issue that is front and center um, in the uh, political uh, conversations, um, at least, um, and that relates um, uh, very uh, directly uh, with uh, the issues uh, that were discussed uh, in the previous uh, panel um, in relation to the European um, in industry um, and uh, trade um, policies, um, I would say. Um, it, it, it's not always easy, um, I must say, um, uh, these days um, um, in the context of the fragmentation uh, that previous uh, speakers um, have mentioned to be clear um, about the different um, initiatives or, or places um, in the negotiation uh, where uh, that conversation um, on the objective and, and, and the means of the energy transition is, is taking place um, at COP28. Um, uh, but precisely, it's at least uh, those two different uh, places. It's the political um, initiatives, um, if you will, um, expressed in texts of declaration that don't necessarily um, have a legal standing um, or, um, in fact, in many cases, um, neither do they have follow through, uh, which is an issue um, I'll um, come back to um, 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 at the end here. Uh, but um, the, the initiatives um, that are being discussed at the moment um, um, relate to um, the objective of the tripling um, of the uh, renewables um, energy installed uh, capacity by uh, 2030 globally. Um, um, another global objective, the um, uh, uh, doubling um, um, uh, um, uh, our energy efficiency again globally and, and by the same date, um, um, a third um, 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 initiative to uh, phase out um, now, um, hopefully very quickly, uh, methane um, emissions from the oil and gas industry because it's a promise um, that's been made um, um, a very long time ago now, um, so it really needs to happen um, as soon as possible. Um, in addition to all of those um, uh, specific initiatives, um, there is also a, a, a place um, uh, that will be negotiated uh, through um, a COP uh, decision, and that's what um, relates to the, the, the overall objective of the energy transition itself. Um, and whether um, um, we express it as um, a phasing out or down um, of fossil fuels or fossil fuel emissions. I mean, that's basically the four um, different options um, in the in the negotiation um, at the moment. Um, I'll, I'll just say to be brief uh, that the 
negotiation of the uh, European Council uh, conclusions um, uh, just a few days ago uh, probably give um, a bit of a preview um, of what will be uh, the global uh, conversation in a few weeks from now in, in Dubai. Uh, some of you may know um, uh, the very helpful role um, that um, uh, Minister uh, Teresa Ribera uh, played for um, Spain and the rest of Europe and the role of the presidency, uh, very much with uh, the support from the Commission and and um, others um, in Europe. I'll not I'll not name uh, um, all of them, but you also know that it was a, a tough and in part uh, lost debate with um, Hungary and Poland um, in particular um, in relation to um, well the the clarity that it'd be very useful to have um, uh, that the ultimate objective is phasing out fossil fuels and not just fossil fuel emissions, um, even if there are um, indeed very um, uh, um, important sometimes additions uh, to make uh, to that uh, statement, in particular when it comes to the role of um, uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, I thought um, what the Commission and Spain and others um, tried to do to insist on the specificity um, of that use um, sector by sector and um, also to give an idea of proportions um, in between the uh, the small part um, of the solution uh, that CCS uh, may turn out to be uh, versus what needs to be the overall signal um, um, in the um, uh, in the energy um, uh, transition. Um, th that relates um, uh, to my final point here uh, before um, leaving the others uh, for uh, the second part of the conversation on the follow-ups um, from that. But I think I think there is one um, clear uh, ratio, um, if you will, that we should all be looking at when we try to assess um, the outcome of COP28 when it comes to the energy transition, both by states, um, by companies and by investors, um, and that's the ratio of investments in fossil fuels uh, plus CCS indeed versus um, 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 investments in renewable energies, uh, uh, but also more generally energy efficiency and um, um, electrification. Um, of um, energy and uses, um, um, uh, that that to me uh, will be um, 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 a very good um, way to discriminate um, in between the many um, initiatives that will be presented um, at COP twenty eight um, and the ones um, uh, that um, that really uh, matter. Um, I think it's going to be important um, as well, um, and I'll stop there for uh, Europe. Um, to um, find a different way um, of talking to uh, partners in particular in the Global South um, 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 on the occasion of COP28, because indeed spending a lot of my time in Brazil at the moment, um, um, also just coming back from Congo for uh, the Three Basins uh, Summit, um, um, it, it, it's not always obvious to me, um, um, unfortunately, as a European, uh, that Europe um, finds the way uh, for the type of conversations you alluded to um, at the end of the last panels um, on, um, um, well, striking partnerships with uh, countries from the Global South on critical minerals um, um, in addition to local green um, um, industrialized uh, uh, partnerships um, um, in those um, countries, but that's that's a different point. So I'll, I'll stop there to start with. Thank you very much. Um, so now onto the the lever that makes all of this possible. And um, can you tell us what can we expect at COP28 on uh, international climate finance, um, but also on private finance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the issue is a. Uh, uh, climate financing is that we are all referring always to that famous or infamous uh, 100 billion uh, US dollar that never gets to arrive. Uh, but we have to remind that this was set at two, 2009. That is the aftermath of uh, one of the biggest financial crises that we had. And it was thought, the mechanism and the, and the, and the, the final delivery of how the outcomes should be, 
that was thought, I believe, mainly uh, for public finance and not taking into account uh, really uh, uh, to, to what extent private finance would be needed. We all knew that it is needed now more than ever, uh, but what I think is that mm, negotiations should mm, and maybe will uh, include this time uh, different designs, different mechanisms and not uh, only being based or mainly being based in figures, final figures and final dates and multi-year dates. Uh, this is intentional, of course, and, uh, but mm, what I think that can change things is the implication of the private sector, private uh, uh, finance, uh, finance sector. This uh, is something that we have all seen happening, mainly uh, not only in the financing part of the equation, but mostly in the investment part of the equation, where, uh, where we have seen that uh, regulations have changed and have uh, been accelerating uh, to, to bring uh, sustainability, but moreover the E of the ESG, you know, the environmental part of the investment, uh, into place and making uh, people aware uh, that this is something that we all need. It is not uh, something that can be uh, delayed anymore. Uh, it is true that, uh, that regulations come from the, the public uh, uh, part of the society or, or the agents, uh, and regulations uh, imply all society, but um, in, in those such uh, big uh, um, pledges, uh, you, uh, we sometimes uh, forget how to um, make those decisions capillar and, and that they are understood by every agent in the economy. And I think that this is something that, it, that lacks uh, the interest of the um, citizens. Uh, not not uh, by itself, because if you ask uh, any of, uh, of the people that you can find uh, wherever you go, they will all tell you that they are worried by climate change uh, problems and they, of course, would like that uh, the uh, financial sector would finance, private financial sector would finance uh, a lot uh, more than it's done, uh, all these transition economies, etc. But when you come uh, to, uh, to the very first stages of the investment decisions or the financing decisions, this is really not something that you feel uh, that is going to bring you some return, at least not in the, in the short uh, uh, term. And mm, this is one of the main problems that we have been suffering in the last two years. And in the last two years, uh, of course, the war in, in Ukraine, but also uh, the inflationary problems and the, the rising interest rates uh, are, again, the first thing that you look in when you are into financial sector uh, budgeting uh, plans or even if you are a private investor. Uh, we are always told, and it is true, that tackling climate change is urgent, but the problem uh, is with the word urgent is that sometimes, like it has happened in 2020 with the pandemic or in 2022 with the war, there are some more urgent short-term urgencies that just mm, redefine your priorities in that very same year. From, since, 19, since, since 2019, four years have been, <laughs> we have been through different urgencies that have required a different allocation of money than what you were thinking on a very long term plan at, such as the 15 years plan for, for, for countries for financing climate, uh, climate finance. No? For example, it is estimated that uh, this year, uh, last year, there was uh, the same amount, I believe, 100 billion uh, US dollars allocated to uh, the war in Ukraine and the different places in, uh, that, that resulted from that. That was, that was urgent and that was not planned. So this, this, this is something that we have to understand when you, when you um, try to understand why, it's not the only reason of course, but, but why uh, uh, financing has fell short. Because really the, the, the short time is, is something, that the short time period uh, planning is something that, that uh, was not that urgent or that important um, 10 years ago, but five years ago or three years ago, it has become uh, the main source of, uh, of, of planification, no? the short-time problems that we have. Rising interest rates, of course, uh, uh, makes everything different from what the, the, the status of the, of the balance that you had back in, 20, in, in 209, which we, we have been enjoying uh, a decade of low to non-interest rates, and the world has changed completely. So it's a fragmented world, but it's also a very different world a decade, uh, that then, then a decade ago uh, we had. So um, 
of course, we need an, uh, it's going to be a new, uh, a new plan, a new financing plan, because this one is, is over in 2025, so you, you, need, you need another one. But I think that the main uh, difference here is going to be or should be in, in the design of it and the implication, the different implication of the private sector, uh, uh, because right now it's almost uh, everything, every alliance that we have seen and every initiative uh, that, that, that counts is voluntary or it's something that, it's, that has been uh, well, pledged by some very important uh, uh, actors in the financial sector. But, um, for example, GFANS, uh, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, is only two years, two years and a half old. No? So, um, it's a new paradigm in, in, uh, in the financial sector with new uh, challenges mainly coming from financial factors such as, uh, as interest rates and, and economic factors such, such as inflation. Uh, so we cannot let that these short-term urgencies uh, will prevent us from designing a new uh, commitment, financial commitment that includes the private sector in, in somehow in a different uh, uh, role than that it had uh, until now. Okay, um, and I'm thinking ahead um, we've talked about you know how we need to think about international climate negotiations in moving forward um, talking to different actors we see a contraction and convergence narrative um, by which these actors say well you know we are backsliding or we are delaying our ambitions and we are converging in that discourse versus science, and uh, Michael was talking about having informed and data-driven um, analyses. So we have science on the other side saying we need to scale up, accelerate immensely, and we need to adhere to the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. So there's a clash, and I, I want to ask both of you um, how you know, future climate negotiations can play out and how we can make them um, work more and faster. Uh, Emmanuel. Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, that very good question. And it's easy for me to build um, on, on um, what was uh, just said. Um, um, I think, by the way, what connects the two part um, of the conversation um, is the outcome of COP28 um, on the uh, global stock take um, of the uh, Paris Agreement. Um, um, and well, in addition to what I said earlier, um, um, in relation to the energy transition, um, in addition to the funding for the newly established uh, loss and damage uh, fund and a few other things, um, uh, this is the other uh, very important uh, thing to watch um, at COP28 because this is what starts paving the road um, that will go from uh, COP28 um, in Dubai to COP30 um, in Belém in Brazil um, in 2025 for um, uh, the 10 years um, already of the um, uh, Paris Agreement. Um, and um, I think what we're going to have to do um, in, in those two years um, um, is not just uh, um, implement uh, the Paris Agreement or implement um, the uh, policies and measures and, and uh, targets uh, climate-wise that have been taken in Europe and other parts of the world. Um, uh, because if we only do that, and as important as implementation is um, as a theme, um, um, the gaps when it comes to mitigation and adaptation and um, uh, the finance and investment for it um, are so big that it's um, at least a matter of um, acceleration um, and, and not just um, implementation uh, that's um, at stake. Um, I'll, I'll just say, uh, because indeed uh, the issue is very dear um, uh, to my uh, heart at a personal level, uh, that there are also probably some evolutions um, um, in the um, uh, Paris Agreement or um, in the global um, uh, governance uh, for climate action that are very much necessary um, 
um, and I'll uh, mention one in particular uh, because I think it was already a theme of the previous panel and um, of our um, uh, two interventions on, on this one. Um, th there needs to be something uh, that uh, manages the risk of fragmentation of everything, but also of, of this um, uh, global climate negotiation. Um, there, there are too many um, initiatives um, in all sorts of directions. Uh, they've got a bit on steroids, um, if you want my opinion, since um, uh, Glasgow uh, for COP26. Um, a lot of them, uh, frankly, and we've done the analysis, commissioned the reports, um, are not um, uh, following through um, on the um, 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 uh, promises and 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 um, um, intended um, actions. Um, so um, and this is where um, I think um, uh, uh, people are looking at the need to reprioritize um, uh, the initiatives uh, space. So everything that is under the umbrella of the um, uh, UN high level climate champions. Um, reprioritize um, around a few key themes or, or deliverables. Um, uh, the, the negotiation um, itself, um, um, as I said, um, I think it needs to be on the acceleration um, of the climate action pre-2030 um, as much um, as it needs to be about setting new objectives, but there is, there is um, uh, a great amount of uh, 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 new um, objectives uh, fatigue um, at this uh, moment, um, at least in the context of um, global uh, symmetry. Uh, so I think um, uh, what's even more um, important um, is in a way um, uh, what um, Europe is doing um, at the moment um, at home, um, which is to face uh, the consequences um, um, of um, uh, the huge um, um, investment walls uh, we've got uh, in front of us um, when it comes to the different um, um, aspects of the transition, both on the mitigation uh, side of things and on the um, adaptation um, side of things, um, and, and find the ways through debt or new fiscal resources, um, at the end of the day, um, um, it can't be many uh, other things, um, 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 if not at least one of those two, um, to pay for the transition um, um, in a way that is fair um, uh, when it comes to both um, 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 income generation um, and um, uh, uh, the um, uh, targets um, um, of those um, um, investments. Uh, what what strikes me, um, and I'll uh, yes. Sorry, I, I, I need to cut you um, short there. Um, if we have time, um, I'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Anna, if if I may, um, so what are the key levers to make the transition happen from a financial and investment point of view in moving forward, mm -hmm. and how can citizens appropriate that? Yeah. And how can we engage them? Because I know we discussed, mm -hmm. you know, in, in previous talks that, uh, you know, that's probably uh, one of the missing links. Absolutely. And I, it's my personal belief, and I've always been uh, an advocate to that. Uh, we are missing the link with the private, uh, uh, I, I was going to say uh, sector, finance sector, but not. It, it's really the customers. It's really the citizens, the voters. I mean, the, you, me, uh, the, the people that really are not, uh, the, um, or they don't feel part of these uh, decisions, and, and I can tell you from experience. I mean, uh, I've been uh, uh, working in asset management for, for a lot of years or decades, and, and, and I know that in the last uh, 15 years, uh, it all has, and, and more in the last decade, it all has shifted to sustainability and to introducing ESG everywhere. But even if you are a fund manager or a fund uh, investor, you are institutionally uh, talking. You, you are a fund or you are an asset owner, and, and you make decisions uh, that are linked with the decisions that are made on the corporate uh, part of the business where you work. But then you have to ask for the money of retail uh, investors. And they, and they have to understand why we are asking for that money. 
right now, it is not only in Spain, it's everywhere, uh, right now people um, are, don't feel part of the discussion or part of the decision financially, I, I'm, say, I'm saying, because we have teach them how to recycle, maybe, and nobody asks anymore for a plastic bag when they go to a supermarket. But they don't do the same when they make financial decisions because it's not in their agenda. All those things are not in the agenda of normal uh, people walking in the streets. So they have to believe or to trust in what the salespeople in the financial institution are telling them. And sometimes those, those uh, big forces, which are the commercial people in the financial institutions, are not that, uh, they don't feel that implied also. So they feel like, what am I, what, what do I have to say? What the corporate uh, message is, so I say the corporate message, but I don't feel like I'm having any say on that. And it is really a powerful force. And I always put the, the same example of the plastic bags because it really, it, it, it's so clear. I mean, nobody is forcing any supermarket to have plastic bags because you have understood that this is not good, it's bad. And they have alternatives. And those alternatives are, are maybe a bit costly because they, they charge you for those new uh, type of bags, but everyone has assumed that for a greater good because you feel part of it. The common goods that were Jose Juan were, were, was talking about, no? the common goods uh, uh, are, are understood. It doesn't happen the same in the financial part, which is really important without financing uh, all, all the transition and investing in the transition, we are not going to deliver. So we need to uh, uh, integrate and to incorporate the thinking of the common normal people, which, is, which are also the owners of the common goods, so they understand what is missing in their investment or financing decisions. And I feel that right now this is not in the, in the agenda. And if this is so, and then we can argue that demand is mm, a powerful force that will make also all the financial sector uh, even more eager to change uh, the, the design of the products, the finance structures that they have into what people that is, is really keen on, 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 uh, on improving. And, and, and it's a question of everybody here. It's a task for, for everyone. It's, a, it's not, we sometimes, I, I sometimes feel that we are all, always expecting that someone tells us this is what you have to invest in. Someone tells us that this is what you have to consume. Uh, this is what you, so it's, it's really not uh, that embedded into the process and into the mindset uh, of, a, of, an, of a financial decision. And, and I really, really believe that this is such a powerful force that we are missing in all, in all, the, in all this, this different uh, ways of uh, finding how to finance. Uh. Thank you. I don't think we have um, time for more, so I'll, I'll just wrap it very quickly up. Um, it's been a very interesting discussion. We've uh, gone through uh, what we can expect from COP28, um, including that commitment to triple renewables, to double energy efficiency, uh, that the European Commission, along with the COP President Al Jaber, have been talking about for a long time and along, alongside other um, actors. Um, we also expect uh, advances in international climate finance. Um, and uh, I will just underline a couple of issues in moving forward. So implementation, implementation, implementation. We need to stick to what science is telling us and to the facts um, within, um, within a narrative as well. I think that's, um, that's also come out uh, a few times during our talk today. Um, delivering and uh, changing our priorities and accelerating and uh, obviously looking at not only the supply side of the market but also the demand side of the market. Uh, thank you ever so much. It's been my pleasure and honor and uh, we hope to see you next year as well. Gracias a Lara, Ana, Emmanuel.